Well, we're going to talk today, um, the message is entitled, One Nation Above God. Okay, and, and, uh, but first of all, before we get into the message, I'd highly encourage you to go back and, and listen to the Wednesday night messages. Pastor started a new series, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, specifically on the Beatitudes. And the first time he, he talked about blessed are the poor in spirit. And then that second one, he talked about blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And you do, you think of these families down in Texas and out in Buffalo and all the things that are going on. And, and again, there's tragedies that are happening all the time. But praise God that God is the God of the comfort. Amen. And like, like with Memorial Day, if you have lost a loved one, God is there to comfort you. Don't blame God. Don't run from God. Run and press into God. And then Wednesday night, we talked about blessed are the meek and, and how that's, that's strength under control or, or power under control. And I think of our nation is like that. You know, we could do a lot of things, but, you know, it's the strength of our military. And a lot of people don't maybe agree with that. But with that strength under control, control, you know, it, it keeps things at bay and at peace and whatnot. Uh, so Memorial Day, just, you know, last year I, I talked specifically on Memorial Day exactly what it, what it is and whatnot, but, you know, it's an American holiday. It's always observed on the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who did give the ultimate sacrifice that died while serving in the U.S. military. And a, a lot of people get it kind of confused with Veterans Day, and, and I know the veterans that, you know, have served or, or are con- currently serving, you know, they don't want to be... Um, thought of actually on Memorial Day, they, they tell you that. They, they say Memorial Day is for those fallen soldiers, and, and Veterans Day is, is something completely different. Um, you know, I, I read this quote. I, I thought it was so powerful. It was by a, a 5th Division graveyard sign. This was a sign in Iwo Jima, Japan, and it states it well. It says, when you go home, tell them for us and say, for your tomorrows, we gave our today. You think about that. For, for our today, for our tomorrows and what we're living in today, they gave the ultimate sacrifice, amen? And and freedom, again, is not free. And and this word freedom, you know, that we have is, for me, it's evolved. I mean, initially, it was very selfish. It was, was, I want to do what I want, when I want, with who I want, for however long I want. There's a lot of of eyes in there, right? That's very selfish. But I think Galatians chapter 5 says it very well. It, It says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, Use your freedom to serve one another in love. And isn't that what it's all about? I mean, that, that's truly what it's all about. And again, we can get very selfish and, and uh, we can just confuse the liberties that we have. As Pastor said, if, if you're to go out and travel the world, you'll quickly realize that, that we do live in the greatest nation on planet Earth, not without its problems. But again, you know, people aren't trying to, to get to Russia and, and China and all these other countries. They're still trying to get to America. Amen. Amen, and don't forget that. So one nation above God. I, I uh, you know, as I was preparing the message, it, it just, it took a while. Sometimes you kind of wrestle with, with what to do, you know, and I uh, had to do the wedding Friday night, so I was just focused on that. And, and after that, on, on Saturday all day, I, I was just praying and, you know, just had a heavy heart just with, again, what's been going on, you know, and of course, all over the media and whatnot. And, and you know, we, we do mourn, you know, we, we we, we rejoice with those that rejoice, and we weep with those that weep, and, and that's a normal thing. But again, we just, we don't stay there long term. But, you know, there's this, this uh, pastor out of, of Westside Christian Fellowship in California. His name is, is Shane Eidelman, and he wrote a book. It, it's, uh, it's called, again, One Nation Above God. And this guy, you know, a lot like pastor, very balanced. He's, he's spirit-filled. He, he teaches the Word of God. But again, he's got common sense that, that keeps him down the middle. And, and just again, like, like pastors have done here for, for the last 41 years. But again, um, you know, just very learned in, in just American history and, and whatnot, because there's a lot of discrepancies, you know, and, and the schools aren't teaching, you know, everything that it is that we need to know of, of how this nation was founded on godly principles. And I know, you know, in, in history, there, we've got this black eye of, of, of slavery and whatnot. But if you go in and you actually do the research, when the pilgrims and the Puritans first came, you know, in the early 1600s, it wasn't that way. But again, you know, the devil's going to come in and try to corrupt things. So it's like you've got to use discernment and you've got to get to the truth. Otherwise, you'll believe, you know, this nation was, was built on a shaky foundation and, and it wasn't so. And, and you think about America. You know, I, I can't, there's nowhere in the world that has propagated the gospel more than the United States of America. No, no nation that has more souls won than the United States of America. However, there's no other nation that, that, that puts pornography out there more than the nation of America as well. So it's like, you know, we can't have it both ways here. Amen? And so a lot of times, you know, we, we try to figure out why are we at where we're at. 
Psalms chapter 33. And, and here's the deal. I'm going to give a lot of scriptures today. If you take notes, awesome. But I, I really just encourage you today to just be intentionally here. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't recommend throat punching anybody, but I'll, I'll tell you this. If, if your neighbor's playing video games or, or scrolling through on Facebook, maybe just a pop on the mouth. You know, I, I got popped on the mouth when I was a kid. And I just kind of, it doesn't knock you out, but it just kind of wakes you up where you're like, you know what, I, I need to be paying attention because today is a serious day. Amen. Psalms 33 verse 12, it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So say it, say it another way. If, if we keep God at the center of everything and, and Jesus is the Lord of our life, our nation will be blessed. And people say, is, is, is America a Christian nation? Well, it, it's really not a, a, an accurate question because a nation is like an entity, kind of like a business. And, and a nation's made up of people. And so again, you have to look at the people. Are the people, because human beings are Christians or not Christians, based on your acceptance or rejection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Abraham Lincoln said this way back in 1863. He says, but we have forgotten God, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our own hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. And, and you think about that, you know, it, that was way back in 1863. So, you know, what we're going through is, is nothing new. You know, it, it's just, it, it continues to get, you know, worse and worse as we drift away from God. But, but they, have a, they had an excessively high opinion of themselves. You know, and, and when you do that, that's pride and arrogance. And what's God say? He resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. And I'll tell you what, you want to figure out if, if God's grace is, is on America or not, you know, we keep going in the direction that we're going, and once his grace comes upon, you know, off of it, you'll figure out real quick what the grace of God does in, in our lives. You know, it, the Bible says, I am what I am, but, but by the grace of God. A lot of times we don't realize how, how powerful God is, how, how much his grace is working in our lives. I'm telling you what, to, to get out of bed every morning and, and brush your teeth and tie your shoes, it's by the grace of God, Amen. I am by what I am by the grace of God, and that's all of us here today, and we never want to forget that. So I always like to have kind of a, this is what helped me kind of put this together. I was like, finally, I just said, Lord, what, what's the goal of the message here today? And, and it was really twofold. You know, why are we at where we're at as a nation? Like, like why are we here? How did we end up here? And second, what are we going to do about it? And, you know, Pastor Vicki in prayer this morning talked about taking action. You know, not just in the spirit. Yes, we pray. But you also have to take action as well, and, and it's, a, it's a two-sided coin. You know, it's just like you can, you can pray for finances all day long, but until you sow a seed, you know, and, and tithe and, and, and get in action, you know, your, your finances are, are going to be, you know, lacking. It's just how it is. It's the Word of God. So again, why are we at where we're at, and what can we do about it? Uh, Arnold Toynbee, he was a British historian, and he said this, of the 22 civilizations that have appeared in history, 19 of them collapsed when they reach the moral state that America is in today. And so America, you know, it's, it's again, it's not the nation, it's the people. You know, and, and, and a lot of the people are, are sick. You know, they've, we, what, what have we been talking about? You know, God is always ahead. We've been talking about the heart. We, we talked about the parable of the sore for, for weeks on end. What was that all about? It was all about our heart. And, and Pastor always says this. He says, your heart is going to be tested. Amen? You know, what, what's, what's, is, it, is it fertile soil so when the word of God goes in, it, it can produce a harvest? Or is your heart, or is your heart hardened, you know, or, or what stage of the game is it in there? So again, you know, I believe God is always ahead and, and he's been preparing us for all the things that are going on. Amen? But you've got to listen and you've got to pay attention, you know, to, to again, the times and, and the seasons we live in. So, you know, the big question is, 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 is how did these nations, these, these 22 civilizations, how did 19 of them collapse? Well, put up that image of, of what's called the Titler cycle. Tytler was a, a guy that, that invented basically this cycle. And, and you know, everything kind of starts out this way. Not only a nation, but, but us in our own lives and, and, and businesses and so on and so forth. They go through these cycles. And, you know, you think about the Israelites back in Egypt. They, you know, they found themselves in slavery at the very top there in, in bondage. And that's how we were without Christ, right? We were in bondage. And then, and then somebody shared the gospel with you and, and, and faith came up. Faith comes by hearing and you heard the word of God and then faith welled up in your heart, you know, and, and, and then it started. And then, you know, that faith turns into courage. 
know, that's what happened with the Israelites, you know, Moses leading them out of the, uh, you know, into the promised land, out of slavery in Egypt. You know, that faith turns into courage, and then courage turns into liberty, and, and liberty is the word freedom. That, that's an awesome place to be, like that Galatians 5 that we talked about, you know, having the liberties and the freedoms that we experience here in this nation. The unfortunate thing is, is as liberty continues to progress, it turns into abundance, and we start focusing more on material things and what we have rather than our relationship with God. And what's he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his right way of living, and all of those things, all of the abundance will be brought to you as a byproduct. Amen? As the story goes, we know we go from abundance, then it turns into selfishness. Remember what I said? I want, you know, I want to do what I want, when I want, with who I want, for however long I want. Sounds like selfishness. It's all about me and my stuff. Selfishness drifts into to complacency. So, you know, comfort is a good thing. You know, when it's, when, it's, when it's in a good balance, I think the healthiest balance here is, is right between freedom and abundance. And it's, it's, it's kind of like a teeter-totter. You know, when, when we were kids at school, you know, you, you had the teeter-totters and you got on, on, each got on one end and it, it went up and down. And if you had a, a heavier set kid on one side, it, it pushed the balance up. But again, you know, you wanted to, you wanted to keep that thing balanced as long as you could. And, and there is a healthy tension there. Amen? So between liberty and abundance is where we want to stay. But just the natural tendency, when all of our needs are met and, and things are going really good, you know what human nature does. It naturally takes the foot off the gas, right? And then, and then it turns into that complacency where it's, it's a sense of entitlement that, that now it's, it's, it's I'm owed this, yeah. right? And, and, and our perspective changes. And, 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 you know, you hear this all the time. It's not my fault. You know, it's, it's, it's the Republicans or it's the Democrats or who's in the White House or who's in this. and who. We want to blame everybody else rather than taking personal responsibility for where we're at in our own lives. And the only house you can change is your house. Amen? Amen. And then apathy sets in. I'll never forget, as long as I live, sitting in a meeting, I was in a leadership meeting down in Dallas, Texas with the business that we were a part of, Advocare, and they, and they put this up, and they said, the, the yellow lights are flashing right now. The warning beams are going. We are in apathy. And they said apathy was like this. It's, it's like somebody, you, you know, those, those bridges that you walk across that they're rope, and, and then they have wooden, wooden you know, uh, basically planks, that's it. And as you're walking, you know, you don't realize it because you're moving forward, but the planks are breaking one by one behind you. And if, if you slow down, eventually it'll take you out and you'll end up falling. That's apathy. We don't recognize where it is that we're at because we've become so complacent. You know, it's the old thing of, of boil, boiling the frog in hot water, right? You put it in uh, normal water and then you just heat it up and, it, and, it, and it's so complacent it doesn't even realize where it's at. And then apathy ends up turning into dependence. Government is not God. God is God. Amen? And I'm not saying, hey, the government was put in place to, to, for protection and whatnot, but, you know, originally, and, and Pastor Vicky talks about, you know, the, the church was put in place where, where we were supposed to be the ones out helping people and whatnot, but, but, you know, now it's all, you know, all this, you know, social stuff and, and whatnot, and hey, if you've got to use that from time to time, I mean, when I was in prison, my wife had our, our boys on, on uh, you know, the insurance with the state, and it was a blessing for that season, but however, when I got out, I went to work and didn't continue to look to the government for a handout because it becomes dependent, amen? And then once you get dependent on somebody else to meet your needs, you'll get into bondage. And I'm telling you, you know, we've got people in this room that, that have moved out of communist areas, socialism and so forth, and they could get up here and explain exactly what it's like. I, I had a guy that, that used to do our upholstery for the gym, you know, and I can't remember where he came out of. It was somewhere in the Ukraine or, or uh, the Russian area or whatnot, and, and he just tells story after story of, we do not want to drift in that direction and, and so forth. So again, you know, what do you do with this? You, you recognize where is it that we're at and, and, and even specifically you're at. Because again, you can't change anybody else. You can only change, change yourself. Remember, it's, it's about the heart issue. And the heart can be off in, in, you know, many different areas. You know, we talk about the faith as the foundation, then your family and your relationships, then your personal health and fitness, and finally, the finances are the least important. But if that, if that foundation is cracked, amen, and we don't keep God at the forefront and, and we end up replacing uh, God with government, this thing isn't going to work long term. And I'm not trying to be a heavy message here, but, but even with Abacare, I wanted to know where we were at. I knew behind the scenes things were eroding but they didn't want to tell us. They didn't want to tell us the truth. 
You know, and I, I apologize, you know, a lot of people are obviously gone on vacation and that you showed up here this morning, but again, I would rather know the truth and know where we're at and be able to do something about it, amen, than sit around and, and, and just in complacency and apathy and, and, and then regret. I, I read this, this, this thing, it says, the pain of regret is far greater than the pain of discipline. So we have to discipline ourselves, otherwise we'll end up in regret. And I've had regret m- many times in my life. I remember sitting in a jail cell down the way here, going to prison and laying there and going, how did I end up here? I I wasn't raised this way. You know, my mom didn't, didn't, you know, she had Christian values. How did I end up here? You know, when when Avicare blew up and and this unbelievable business that everybody wanted to be a part of, we had the NFL and and NASCAR and Major League Baseball and, and, you know, what what was the deal? We we, We were excessively high about our opinion of ourselves, too big to fail. That's what we thought, amen, and ended up getting humbled. Humble yourselves lest you will be humbled, amen. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says this, today I have given you the choice between life and death, blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. He says, oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live, You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. Sounds like discipline, right? Pain of discipline or the pain of regret. You get to pick your pain. Amen? The key, this is the key to your life. Loving the Lord, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land. Uh, The Lord swore to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I love how it says that. Oh, that you would choose life so that not only you, but your descendants might live. It's not just about us. It's about that next generation as well. Amen? And again, if the school system isn't teaching all the things that, you know, how, how this nation was founded on faith and, and whatnot. And, you know, I think about this, this 18-year-old, and I'm not trying to make him a, a victim whatsoever. However, if you look at his life, I'm certain, you know, he had a, a grandma that he lived with, and it sounds like he didn't have any parents in the household and, you know, no dad there and, and you know, probably didn't pay any attention in school and, and whatnot and, and just drifted out on his own. You know, very similar situation. My dad died when I was 10, and, you know, a young man is always looking for role models, looking how to be a man. And I didn't have those strong male role models in my life. And, you know, it's just how things progressed end up in prison. And so I always tell my boys, if if you don't discipline your life, life will end up disciplining you. You know, and it was 28 years old when, when I was shared the gospel for the first time and Pastor Mike came down and in jail, my life was disciplined, and that's where I heard about the gospel for the first time, gave my life to Jesus Christ, and, and thankfully everything turned around. However, I still had to pay the penalty and the price for the choices that I had made. Amen? The pain of regret is far greater than the pain of discipline. Isn't that powerful? The biggest thing is this, is you have a choice. You've got a choice. Life or death. Blessing or cursing. And again, he says, choose life. Amen? That you and your descendants might live. This, this nation, is, it's worth fighting for. Amen? It's worth turning our hearts back and, and praying and disciplining ourselves to do the hard things that we need to do. Again, when you look at that cycle and wherever you're at on the cycle, to, to you turn it around. Like, like I have to do as well. I have to hold the mirror up to my own life. You know, yesterday just sitting there in, in my prayer closet and just thinking about where am I at on this spectrum? You know, what can I do better? I can't make anybody else do anything, but I can control me, and I can raise up to a higher level, amen, and raise the standard. Dennis Burke said said this, he said, God moves where he is wanted. And I was like, man, is that powerful. And I know I shared a little bit of this on, on Wednesday night at the end of the message on talking on meekness, but think about that. God moves where he is wanted, not where he's needed, where he's wanted. Pastor always says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. We keep pushing them out. That was the end of our advocate business. Kept pushing them out. We used to have Sunday services and people got saved. It wasn't to replace church. 
was just a couple times a year is all, but when we were at a, a convention, they, they had it set up that way. And, and the founder, he said the, the first principle was honor God through your faith and family and, and your relationships. And so he said, when, when, when I'm away from home, I go to church. And so he said, I want to provide a church service for all of you as well. But then over time, you know, I, I remember standing in Dallas Stadium, 25,000 people, Michael W. Smith, just worshiping God, just weeping. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. I'm highly addicted to supplements. You know, I, I, I enjoy making money and help it, helping people, you know, and all this stuff. And, 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 you know, and then we've got God in this situation, like pinch me. What's better? Amen. But again, we just slowly started drifting from that. Behind the scenes, they, there was cracks in the foundation. You know, it, again, like that cycle, we had abundance and, and then complacency. And then they started just getting cute with things and saying, you know what, we, we, we and here's the deal. We welcome everybody, but we don't affirm everybody. There's a difference. Amen? So we welcome all types of people in here. Pastors welcome me in. They welcome my wife in, you know, when we were, we were tra- train wrecks, but they didn't affirm the life we were living at the time. Matter of fact, I was standing up here at a, another person's wedding and pastor says to me, you know, when are you going to make an honest woman out of this girl and marry her? Because God can't bless your sin. And guess why I'm here today? Because a man had the guts to speak strength to me. And, 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 and leaders are drawn to strength, not weakness. Strength breeds strength. Losers lose and winners win. Amen? And that's just how it is. Amen? Amen. And so they just continued to drift and, and, and continued to take God out of everything. And now we got to go Thursday night, Friday, and be back Saturday because they told us that, hey, people want to be back on Sunday. And, and I would just watch my business and how it would erode because, see, God's, God's grace was being pulled off of it because God moves where he's wanted. Amen? Amen. And, and it was founded on godly principles. Now, if it weren't founded on godly principles, it's a, it's a different story because we didn't have God in there in the first place. But again, when we, we step up and we say, God, we, you know, we want your hand of blessing upon this in the early days when we didn't know up from down and as we were building a business and whatnot. And, and, you know, and, and then at the end, it's like they end up forgetting about God and pushing him completely out. And then you know, I'd get up to speak and before I'd speak, I'd have to go talk to an attorney because you, know, you can't say this and you can't say that and it removes the heart from it. It removes the passion from it. From it, you know, and, and Canada, they can't say certain things. So imagine being up here and every word that you speak, you know, you're like on video and you're like worried about it. That removes the passion, you know, and, 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 and it removes the anointing off of what it is that you're doing. Amen. And that's exactly what happened. Amen. And the final straw was this. I said it on, or on Wednesday night, you know, page one of our impact magazine, honor God through our faith and our family and our friends. And then in the middle, and again, we welcomed everybody but we don't affirm everybody's lifestyle. In the middle, there's a, a, a rainbow with a, a homosexual couple that, that they're highlighting there. And again, it's a slap in the face to God. Hey, I know you said that you founded this company on God, but now you're saying we don't want him in here anymore, but we still want God's hand of blessing, but we don't want his heart. We don't want his principles anymore. We just want his prosperity. And it wasn't long before the FTC come in and started, you know, pulling, you know, talking to people, and, and then they decided that, that people were, were um, you know, basically saying, hey, you buy in, and you end up getting rich and all this stuff, and, and Advocare didn't have the guts to, because it, everything had been, you know, all the, the strength had been pulled out of there at that point. They didn't have the guts to fight the government, and now it's still around, but it's like a skeleton compared to how it used to be. They paid a $150 million fine, and, and, and again, we, I never would have dreamed in a million years that something like that could happen. America, amen? And I'm not trying to do a doom and gloom here. It's not about that. It's about where are we at individually, amen? amen. The strength of the nation will depend on the stability of the family. The spiritual state of a nation simply reflects the spiritual uh, state of our people. Spiritual decay undermines stability. Remember, faith at the foundation, when there's cracks in the foundation, nobody comes up and looks at the foundation of Faith Family Church, but, but if there are cracks here, the thing's going to topple over, amen? But thank goodness we're built on a firm foundation, the foundation of the rock of Jesus Christ, amen? When the family deteriorates, the deterioration of the nation is close at hand. Sexual sin undermines the health and often results in the death of a family, a marriage, and the integrity of an inv- individual. The entire family loses, What's it say? That's what sin does. The wages of sin is death. Not physical death, but sexual compromise. That's the death of your marriage most times. Amen? Amen. 
You know, I had the honor, like Pastor said, to officiate uh, uh, Dylan and Tiana's wedding on, on Friday night and, you know, made it through. But at the end there, you know, a lot of times we do the, the unity candle or like unity sand or whatnot, and, and they wanted to do a prayer, which was really cool. It, it, it took me off the hook, amen? So I, I just stood back, and, and, and man, I just started to tear up because I watched Dylan and Tiana, and then I watched all their family come around and, and how Alan and, and, and Todd, you know, prayed over their family. And I, I, I was like, this is it. This is it. It's the family unit. It's so simple. It's the family unit. Amen? You've got grandparents serving God and parents serving God, and, and now the kids are serving God, and, and, and then it's very likely that their kids will serve God. Not perfect, but growing in the things of God. Amen? It makes a difference, and it's the foundation. Amen? I watched my neighbor yesterday outside the window. You know, his, his, he's got uh, two boys and a, and a girl. His littlest son is, is about three years old, and, and they buy uh, pickup trucks, and they, they fix them up, and then they sell them. They got a lot up there by uh, the airport, and I just watched out there, and his son was up in the back of the pickup, and, and he was pulling out all the things that were in the, uh, you know, the back end or whatnot and handed them to his dad, and I was like, man, isn't this a picture of America here, right? You know, just, just family, a, a father teaching his son. And my youngest son, Max, his, his grandpa came and picked him up yesterday and brought him over to the house and, and he taught him, you know, he's been mowing our lawn, but now he's teaching him how to mow his lawn and Max is starting a little enterprise, but, you know, initially Max was like, ah, he overthinks things like me. I don't know if I want to go do it or whatnot. And I said, you know what? It's not about mowing the lawn. It's about your grandpa wants to spend time with his grandson, amen? Just spending time together. You know, it's just like watching this. I watch, you know, Papa spending time with his son and, 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 and you know, Andy spending time with Apollo and, and, and just how all of that works, amen? It's the family unit. Again, we welcome everybody in, but we don't affirm, again, certain lifestyles and whatnot, but again, everybody's welcome, but just like me, I, I, man, I needed God to change my life, amen? And this environment and the word of God preached here changed me, amen, as, as it's changed many of your lives. Amen. Psalms 11, verse 3, it says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We're going to talk about doing now. There's a 12-year-old girl that, that uh, went to the Holocaust muse- Museum with her dad and you know, and, and they went through it, and, and you know, obviously there was, was pictures and, and different memorabilia and whatnot, but what really stuck out to her, there was an eight-foot high, uh, you know, um, basically a, a pile of shoes. You know, so when they would put the Jews in the gas chambers, they'd lie to them. They'd say, hey, we're going to, you know, strip down, tie your shoes together, put all your belongings together so that, you know, we want to do this in order. So then when you come out, you know, you can find all of your stuff. Little did they know they were walking into the gas chambers into their death. And obviously this 12-year-old, you know, this was, was a lot for her to, to wrap her head around. And so they left, and it was about a two-hour two drive home. You know, and she was completely silent. She didn't say a word. So, of course, the dad's second-guessing himself and going, man, you know, I, it's too much for her. She was too young. You know, how's a 12-year-old going to end up wrapping her mind around all of this? I, I did more damage than good. You know, and they finally got home and, and pulled up. And then as they're walking up to the house, you know, the, the father had the the daughter's hand, and, and the daughter looked up at the dad, and, and she, said, she said, why didn't somebody do anything? Why didn't somebody do something? And so that's what we talk about. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state, the heart. Amen? He continues, if the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Amen? Martin Luther King said that. And how much farther are we now than than in the 60s? So how do we turn this thing around? I'm going to give you a few points, and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to move through these quickly, and, and uh, then we'll wrap this up. Number one, it's, it's, it's leading a life of integrity regardless of what society promotes. That word integrity is, is moral soundness or uprightness. That's the word integrity. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. A great question to ask yourself, you know, on, on integrity is when you're going out to do something, is this the wisest thing for me to do? A guy named Andy Andrews always asks, is this the wisest thing for me to do? Is it wise for me to, to, to text this female or, or go to coffee with her or, or whatever? Is that the wisest thing for me to do, you know, to have a meeting behind closed doors? Is that the wisest thing for me to do? 
No, the answer is no, in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> but again, you know, you, you ask yourself those questions. You know, things are lawful, but not everything is, is, is helpful. Amen? Another question, ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? All the different things that are out there. You know, now, now they're going to probably legalize weed, okay? Is this the wisest thing for me to do? I, I could point out many people in this room that will tell you that, that were, ended up being addicted to methamphetamines or other hard drugs and whatnot, that weed was the gateway. Now, of course, I, I get it, you know, the medicinal thing, whatever. You want to keep that argument, so be it. But again, you start legalizing things, and I'm telling you, it's a slippery slope. And I know this, my life has been wrecked by sin. 28 years of living for the devil. And other people in here could get up and share the same or similar stories. But see, when your life hasn't been as wrecked by sin, you kind of get a little bit more comfortable with it. Amen? You kind of you nuzzle up to it, and you, you don't really realize, you know, what, what the ramifications are. It's like, it's like playing around with a rattlesnake. You know, you might, you might get away with it for a while, but man, that second you get bit, it's done and over with. Amen? So why am I doing what I'm doing? That, that's the question you ask yourself. And then you ask it again. Well, why is that? Well, why is that? Well, why is that? And if at the basis it's, it's anything other than, you know, something away from, you know, why do I feel the need to, to save up more and more money? Well, because I feel safe and secure. Well, then it's, it's, that's replacing my safety and security and my trust in God. Amen? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Integrity. But see, in the nation now, we've got this, this other doctrine. It's called relativism. The doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context, but they're not absolute. There is no absolute truth. It's like abortion. You know, if, if abortion's good for Susan, because, you know, she's a, a young lady, and, and, you know, she this and that and the other, and if it's good for Susan, then it's okay for Susan. If she believes it's good for her, then it's fine. But if Mary over here believes that it's not okay for Mary, then, then that's fine. It's relativism. It's, it's, it's on the context, or, or it's relative based on the circumstances. There is no absolute truth. Does that sound familiar? That, that's what we're living in. Relativism. That's what it's called. Sex outside of marriage. Relativism. I did it, you know, before I was saved. I, I didn't know any better, but again, there's no excuse. Everyone does it. We're going to get married anyway. Interesting thing that happens. You, you, <laughs> amen, Seth. Don't do that, brother. <laughs> You're exactly right. You start sneaking around, Right? And not only the unclean spirit comes on you, but that, that spirit brings other spirits, that little lion spirit. But then you do get married, but those spirits don't just leave. They're still there. And now you're married and everything's going good, and then all of a sudden those spirits start talking to you again, and you, and you kind of miss the, the excitement of sneaking around and doing those things that you're doing and whatnot, right? But the truth of the Word of God, it, it, it talks about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Pastor Mike was reading this to me one day, and I'm like, I'm married and I feel convicted, but it said, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? For you were bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And I could, I could go into great detail, you know, with, with my life before Christ and all the baggage that you bring into a marriage, you know, the things you got to unlearn and, and things you don't trust your current spouse because of all that stuff, relativism. You know, that, that was good back, you know, in pastor's day. They're old-fashioned, though. It, it doesn't apply anymore. No, there's nothing new under the sun. The same demons that work back then are at work right now, Amen. You guys getting something out of this? I know it's hard, and I don't mean to beat you up. It's, this is about encouraging us to get back and get back where we need to be. Things are, are morally acceptable in other places outside America, like, like killing newborn babies you know, and, uh, or newborn females. In China and India, that, that's just a normal thing. Again, it's relative. You know, and, uh, in other places, sometimes the family will kill a, a woman family member if they're raped. You know, we wouldn't stand for that in America. But again, we keep slowly drifting off and drifting off, and you just never know how you're going to end up. It was just like me, that, that regret I experienced. I said, how did I end up way over here? I wasn't raised that way, but it was one step at a time. Amen? So the first thing that you do, again, is you lead a life of integrity. you got to discipline yourselves. The second thing is, is you tell your kids 
about how this nation was truly founded and, and the miracles that have happened in your life and the lives of those around you. You know, we had a, a conversation with the boys about, you know, what happened in Texas and just asking them what they knew. And, because, again, they can't wrap their head around all this stuff. So we try to help them make sense of it, you know, from a biblical perspective that, you know, there is evil in the world. But again, tell your kids, Psalm 78 says this, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Learn from other people's past mistakes, amen? I, I was so stubborn and hard-hearted, I had to figure it all out on my own, which was not a good way to do it. It says, learn from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he, he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to the children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. Yeah. Amen? Don't leave it up to the school systems. Don't even leave it up to our, our world-class children's ministry. We got to do that ourselves. Verse 7 says, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Amen? And that's where we can end up. Stubborn and unfaithful, refusing to give our hearts to God. And you wonder why, you know, a lot of the next generation doesn't want the God that their parents served. Amen? It's not good. It's because it's, it starts in that home life. That's your number one ministry. I've been guilty of it. You know, you listen to the Gary V's and all these guys that, man, hustle and grind and, and all this stuff and go out and make money. But I'm telling you, Greg Cotman taught me this years ago. He said, he said, get planted in a church first. God will build everything around that and then continue to seek first, you know, his kingdom and his righteousness and he'll build everything around that, amen? And for you young people, I'm telling you, it works. I'm a living testimony of it. So do the same thing. Learn from our past. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 says, Watch out, be very careful, never to forget what you have seen God doing for you. May his miracles have a deep and permanent effect on our lives. Tell your children and grandchildren about the glorious miracles he did. You know, we've got to get our kids engaged in the things of God. This is a supernatural church. Amen? We've got to get our kids engaged in the supernatural. I know Noah, when he went to camp the last time, you know, he, he started laying hands on others, and, and I could see that change because now it wasn't just about him there being receiving, but he was also realizing that, that God could use him too. And I'm telling you, God can use all of you, no matter what the age or, or male or female or background or title, he will use all of you. Amen? But we've got to be in action. The third thing is, is, is voting. Vote for principles, not a particular party. I heard Pastor Vicky say the other night, you know, I'm not even a particular party anymore. I'm a, I, I can't remember what the word was, a constitutionalist. But what does that mean? You pray for the people with the right principles, godly values. Why is he teaching on the Beatitudes? It's your core values, the core values of a Christian, the core values of a kingdom, the kingdom of God. I mean, it does not take a rocket scientist to figure out abortion is wrong. Amen? But again, you know, when we vote on finances and all this different stuff, you know, it's, it's on those core values. Does this person line up with my core value? Well, they're not perfect. You're, you're exactly right. They're never going to be perfect. But they're not the pastor in chief, right? They're the commander in chief. You have a pastor in your life, and he's sitting down here in the front row. Amen? But again, we vote your principles. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but again, you, Jesus wept for Jerusalem. We think that he wasn't involved in, in, in all this stuff, but he wept over Jerusalem. Just like Pastor Mike standing up here having a hard time because he's, he's weeping over this nation. Because at 71, 72 years old, he knows how he grew up and, and, and how the foundation was and, and how we drift away from that and, and how it can erode and, and how this thing can end up. And, and they don't want that to happen. Amen? Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Woodrow Wilson said it this, a nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today nor what it is trying to do. We do need strong leadership, amen? We have to know where we're going and have a crystal clear path on how it is that, that we're gonna get there. Leadership matters, amen? And that's why you pray for your leaders. You don't sit and rip on them and, and whatnot. You know, it's like, you know, with your spouse or whatever. If, if, if you're sitting there and you're critical of her or, or him, you know, and then you go, go pray for them. Amen? That, that God would change their hearts the way that, that, that he's changed our hearts. 
So God's not big enough to, to change all of that. And, and he says he's not willing that any should be perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? Start praying. Get on your knees. Repent. Amen. Stand in the gap for this nation. Amen? It's worth it. Almost last point. Engage not in rage the culture. I see leaders out on, on Twitter, Christian leaders, just sitting and poking the bear. Now, of course, the big thing now, of course, is gun control and all that. Just sitting here poking the bear. No different than the world, you know, no different than I was when I was in business trying to get likes and, and, and shares and, and, and views and all that stuff. And it's like, no, when we enrage people, it creates division rather than unity, amen? And who, who's the divider? Satan, right? Who's the divider? Satan. Who's the uniter? God. And I know we get frustrated. I get frustrated. But again, typically it's best to hold back a little bit, pray, think things through, hear from God first, right? And then take action on what it is that you want to do. Last and final thing, but the most important thing is prayer. Pastor Vicki talked about it this morning. Prayer moves the hand of God. In, in, in this book, One Nation Under God, the history of America it said this, prayer stands as one of the most critical and indisputable factors to have influenced the course of American history. The most critical and indisputable factor. Charles Spurgeon said, I would rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. Amen. Think about that. I'd rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. This is not the goal, standing up here. The goal is being on our knees and praying and, and, and crying out not only for our, our, our own hearts, our, our, our city's heart, our state heart, and, and our nation's heart, and, and this world's heart. Amen? I'm almost done. 2 Corinthians seven fourteen. it says, If God's people will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, he will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Without question, repentance, prayer, and humility before God is our only hope. So you have to ask yourself, do you pray? It's an honest question. You know, not just flipping up a, a prayer every now and again. I know everybody's at different levels and whatnot, but, but do you pray? You know, it's shutting the TV off. You know, shutting off things of the world and, and, and getting alone with God and praying. There's, you know, you go out on the Bible app. There's a, a, a thing that'll lead you in a 30-day prayer for the nation. You know, go to prayer, 8.45 every Sunday morning. The, the numbers have dwindled. Every Monday at noon, you know, we, we pray. We won't tomorrow because we're, we're off because of Memorial Day. But again, it, it's prayer. And I know that doesn't work for everybody. I understand that. But remember, the pain of regret is far greater than the pain of discipline. And if we don't discipline ourselves now, we're going to experience the pain of regret. And I'm not trying to say doom and gloom and this nation's going to crash, but I'm telling you, when I sat in that room with the Advocare thing, I just knew in my gut I'd, I'd have many sleepless nights. I knew in my belly that it could not continue to work the way that it was working. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that, that when we're trillions and trillions of dollars in debt, you know, and we, we have to print more money just pay, to pay the interest on the debt and, and the moral decay and all that stuff, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that, that that's not going to continue on forever. Amen? And I don't know what the ending looks like, but again, I do know that if God, you know, pours out his grace and his mercy and his spirit falls on this land, he will heal the land. But it comes to, for, to us to humble ourselves, to pray, and to seek his face. Amen? Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and Jesus, I make you Lord of my life, and I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.